This is chapter seven, X-ray interactions with matter from your essentials of radiographic physics and imaging book. And this starts on page 74. All right, so interactions with matter. Typically when we speak about matter, we're talking about the patient. And remember that by definition, matter is anything that has mass, occupies space, and has shape. <clears throat> When we start off talking about interacting with matter, um, us having to understand the X-ray photon interaction, like what actually happens in the patient when we make an exposure, is important because if we understand what exactly goes on, we can help to minimize harm to the patient. And also by doing that, we can make a better quality image. Uh, if we can make a better quality image and reduce exposure to the patient, then that is the best thing that we could do because we're offering the radiologist the best possible image and offering the patient the lowest possible dose, which is better, best thing for the patient, honestly. Typically, our role is to minimize harm to the patient and produce a quality radiographic image. That should be our ultimate goal um, in becoming and acting as a radiographer. When we talk about x-rays interacting with matter, they typically interact with matter in five different interactions or five different ways. There are um, classical or coherent interactions, Compton, interactions, photoelectric, pair production, and photo disintegration. The first, the classical interaction or coherent or classical or unmodified, all of those um, names refer to the same interaction. That occurs at energies below the diagnostic range. The next two, Compton and photoelectric, occur in the diagnostic range. Remember the diagnostic range is 30 to 150 kVp. Pair production takes place in nuclear medicine, specifically in PET scanning, and photo disintegration takes place in radiation therapy. So we'll start off looking at these five and we'll actually look at them um, in order from lowest energy, which would be the classical or coherent or unmodified, that's the lowest energy that takes place, and photo disintegration is the highest. So they literally go from lowest to highest energy in order of interaction. The first one that we'll talk about is coherent, and notice it's also called classical or unmodified scattering. Okay, coherent scatter, um, typically in this event, you have an incident X-ray photon. And notice this incident X-ray photon they're showing you right here. Remember in the tube, we had incident electrons, okay? So this incident X-ray photon, notice it's in wave form, which means that it is an X-ray. So this is happening in tissue atoms in the body. I can tell you specifically, this interaction would likely take place in mammography but not in any, any exams that we do, not in diagnostic radiology. But this would probably take place in mammography because they use energies where this would occur. The incident X-ray photon comes in and interacts with an orbital electron of a tissue atom, and it actually changes direction. Notice it's coming in in this direction, and if it continued on, in theory it would go straight, but notice there's a change in direction. Anytime there's a change in direction, it's considered scatter. So in this particular interaction, the incident X-ray photon is a really low energy, typically less than 10 kVp. And when you have that low energy incident photon interacting with a tissue atom, it's not got enough energy to ionize the atom or remove any electrons from their shells. But what happens is that the atom absorbs the energy of the X-ray photon and it causes excitation. Kind of like when we talked about in the tube where the electron passes by and it excites the tungsten atom, which raises it to a higher energy state 
and it releases that excess energy in the form of infrared radiation. When this happens in the body, it causes excitation and it'll immediately release the energy in a new direction. And because that energy gets re emitted in a different or new direction, it is considered a scattered photon. So this incident x-ray comes in, gets this atom excited and raises it to a higher energy state, and it responds by giving off that excess energy in photon form. Now, this incident photon and this scattered photon have the exact same energy, but it travels in a different direction. Notice it has the same wavelength, same wavelength, same frequency. The only difference is it's going in a different direction. So it has equal energy to the incident photon, equal wavelength, equal frequency, but it travels in a new direction. And because it has such low energy, most of these scattered photons get absorbed in the body and they will not contribute to the image, but it will add to patient dose. So in mammography, where we use really low KVP because we're imaging the breast and the breast is made of adipose tissue, this is where you're likely to see this event take place is in mammography because that's about the only place where 10 KVP photon would be useful. So again, coherent incident photon comes in, interacts with the atom, doesn't ionize it, raises it to a higher energy state. That atom responds giving off energy with the same wavelength, same frequency, and same exact energy, but it travels in a different direction, so it's considered scatter. Okay, and that is the first interaction. Energy values are below 10 keV. The second interaction we'll look at is called Compton interaction, which is also scatter. This does occur in the diagnostic range. So this is one of the two interactions that happens in our field. With this interaction, um, Typically, you have an incident x-ray photon entering a tissue atom, and it interacts typically with an outer or middle shell electron, and it removes it from its shell, so it ionizes the atom. Okay, so you can see in this interaction right here, you've got a high energy incident photon coming in, knocking out this, not the outermost shell, but next to it, it knocks out that electron. So you can see when this electron, I'm sorry, when this electron gets knocked out, it's an ejected electron. All right, so it interacts with that orbital electron, removes it from its shell, and it can lose up to one third of its energy in doing so. So it uses some of its energy to knock out that ejected electron. <clears throat> and that ejected electron can be called either a Compton electron, a recoil electron, or a secondary electron. Okay, so this electron gets out, and then this photon continues on in a different direction because it had to give up some of its energy to knock that out. So notice the wavelength is very short and the frequency is very high in the incident photon. But once it gave up some of its energy to knock that out, the wavelength is now longer and the frequency is less. This is kind of like you could relate this to um, a cue ball in pool. Like if you had a ball right here that you were trying to hit and knocked the cue ball into it, it would use some of the energy to move that ball forward. And then the cue ball typically will continue on, but in a different direction. Okay, so this is kind of like Compton. Now, when that scattered photon continues on in a different direction, notice how it's knocking out then an outer shell electron from this atom. So again, this ejected electron is considered a Compton electron, a secondary electron, or it can be called a recoil electron. So that electron gets ejected, and then that gave up some of its energy to knock that out, and it continues on with even less energy. That will continue until that photon no longer exists, until it uses all of its energy 
And this is all happening inside the patient's body. All right, this interaction does three things. It ionizes the atom, making the atom unstable. Okay, and again, this picture to reference it while you're looking at these slides is on page 76. So the interaction ionizes the atom, making the atom unstable. I said that the ejected electron can be called a Compton electron, a recoil electron, or a secondary electron. And that electron leaves the atom with enough energy to go through interactions of its own in adjacent atoms. So that ejected electron could also cause ionization of a nearby atom. The incident photon gets deflected in a new direction, and it is considered a Compton scattered photon. But that has enough energy to go through other interactions in the tissues or it could exit the patient and interact with the image receptor. If that happens, it's actually called fog, patient fog. All right, typically if this photon scatters, it'll scatter forward, not if it scatters, but when it scatters, it will scatter in a forward direction. So if you, are talking about the photons coming from the primary beam interacting with the patient and then scattering forward, forward would be continuing on towards the image receptor. Okay, so typically scatter will go in a forward direction towards the IR. When it does that, it'll actually strike, and when I say in the wrong place, meaning it won't strike directly from where it entered. So it's not going to image anatomy, but it'll actually image or result in image fog. Scatter will never image anatomy. It only takes away from the resolution. If you think about fog when you're driving in a car, what happens with fog? It makes it so that you can't see clearly, you can't see objects, you really can't see that far in front of the vehicle. So this happens the same way in, in our field when we have radiation fog, we're not able to see the anatomy clearly. It doesn't image the anatomy and there's nothing good about fog. It does us no good, it only does us harm. So we attempt to minimize it as much as possible. How do we minimize it? We use equipment that would absorb the scatter radiation before it interacts with the image receptor. And typically with that, I'm speaking about a grid. A grid is placed between the patient and the image receptor to ideally absorb any scatter radiation that's created and to keep it from um, exposing your image receptor. Scatter is one of the most prevalent interactions between X-ray photons and the human body in our field, okay? Another thing that I would mention as far as minimizing scatter, um, the way you can minimize scatter is to collimate appropriately, to not radiate any more than you need to, to use appropriate KVP levels, um, to make the part as thin as possible or compress the part as best you can, and to utilize a grid if needed. They talk about the probability of scatter occurring isn't dependent on the atomic number of the atoms involved, but really it's relative to the energy of the photon because typically when you have higher energy photons, this is when you tend to exhibit more Compton scatter. Okay, so with more Compton scatter, you end up um, having more Compton scatter with high energy photons. The lower energy photons, not so much Compton scatter because they tend to be absorbed. All right, Compton scattered photons tend to retain about two thirds of their energy, and they can actually, those photons can exit the patient and expose the radiographer. So they have two potentials. The Compton scattered photons can either continue forward towards the image receptor and fog our image, or 
if they don't go towards the IR, but they actually exit the patient and they expose us in the room, like during fluoro, that's not good either because typically Compton scatter is the biggest source of occupational exposure. Okay, typically when we get readings on our badges, that's where it comes from, is scatter from a patient. So shielding is definitely necessary during any procedure where us as technologists are going to be near the patient and or the x-ray tube or the fluoro tube during exposure. Because our biggest source of occupational exposure is Compton scattered radiation. Okay, so Compton scatter, nothing good. Radiation fog uh, has the potential to expose the technologist or the radiologist or anybody else in the room. It has the potential to expose your image receptor with what we call radiation fog. And there's nothing good that comes of it. It will never image anatomy. It will only take away from the anatomy that you're imaging. It will um, decrease the visibility of anatomy on your image. So there's nothing good about fog. We can't eliminate it completely because of the kind of things that we are imaging and the energy values that we have to use. But we can attempt to control it as best we can by like I said, collimating appropriately, using the appropriate KVP to pass through the part and to compress the part as much as we can. All right, our next interaction that takes place in the diagnostic range is called a photoelectric interaction. Truly, the interaction is called photoelectric absorption and if we talk about it as photoelectric absorption, it just helps us to recognize what exactly this interaction is doing. Okay, so the picture for this is on page 77. And I should tell you that Compton scatter is responsible for the unwanted shades of gray on our image. Okay, Compton scatter gives us our unwanted gray on our image, whereas photoelectric absorption gives us our areas of white or bright areas on the image receptor, like where our bone is, where our contrast media agents are, our iodine, our barium. In this interaction, the incident X-ray photon interacts with an inner shell electron and ejects electron so that it ionizes the atom. Okay, now in order to do that, this incident photon gives up all of its energy to knock out that electron. When it does, all of this incident photon energy gets absorbed. All right, the ejected electron is called a photoelectron. And just like we've talked before, in order for this incident photon to knock out that electron, the energy of this photon has to be equal to or greater than the binding energy of shell level that it's knocking out. But when we're talking in the tube, we talk about the fact that the uh, control panel had to be set at 70 or higher because the, the binding energy of K shell of tungsten was 69.5. But if you look here, we've got K, L, M, and N. So you've got a lot lower atomic number element because you're talking about things that are in the body. You're talking about calcium, which is number 20, or iron, which is 26. Like you're talking about low atomic number elements compared to number 74, which is tungsten. So this incident photon has to have energy equal to or greater than the binding energy of the shell level that it's knocking out. When it knocks out this electron, we call it a photoelectron. And the only reason we name these specifically is so that you know what interaction we're talking about. If I say there was an ejected photoelectron, then I'd have to be talking about photoelectric absorption. If I said there was an ejected recoil electron or a Compton electron, then you would know that I was talking about Compton scatter. Okay, when that incident photon knocks out that electron, though, all the energy gets absorbed. 
But just like in the tube, when that knocks it out and that atom becomes unstable, you have a characteristic cascade that takes place, meaning that whatever shell level electron is closest to that void when it's gated, it's going to jump in and fill that. But every time it fills a shell level, it releases a photon of energy. But now, since this is from the primary beam, and this energy no longer exists, okay, that's important to recognize, it's called photoelectric absorption. So this entire incident photon is absorbed when it knocks out this photoelectron. All of this radiation is considered secondary radiation, meaning this is happening inside the patient once we utilize the primary beam, we're causing secondary radiation to take place in the patient. This is taking place anywhere there's bone, anywhere there's barium, anywhere there's iodine, anywhere where this radiation energy can be absorbed in something dense or radiopaque. And this allows it to go bright white or light on our images. Right. The ejected electron, like I said, is called a photoelectron. And the energy transfer between the incident photon and that inner shell electron is equal to the incident photon energy minus the binding energy of that orbital electron shell. Okay, so there's enough kinetic energy in order for it to undergo interactions of its own before it would fill a vacancy in another atom elsewhere. So that ejected photoelectron, once it gets knocked out, if it has enough energy, it can go cause an interaction on its own. It might cause a um, Compton scatter interaction. It might get absorbed somewhere else. It might simply fill a vacancy in a photoelectric interaction. Because if you think about it, this photoelectric interaction is exactly like the characteristic interaction that takes place in the tube. The only difference is when we talk about characteristic in the tube, you're talking about an incident electron coming from the cathode to the anode Instruing the tungsten target and causing this ejection of the K-shell in the characteristic cascade. But when it's photoelectric, you're already outside of the tube. You're talking about this primary beam interacting with matter in our patient, ejecting that electron from the body atom and creating secondary radiation within your patient. Okay, so adding to the patient, not only are they absorbing the radiation that we um, have utilized in, in capturing their image, but there's additional radiation created because of what we used. All right, photoelectric absorption contributes significantly to patient dose. Again, this is found anywhere there's bone, anywhere we use contrast media, there is significant absorption of the radiation that we use. This is, although some absorption is necessary in order to create an x-ray image, it's our responsibility to use technical factors that strike a balance between the image quality and patient dose. Okay, so we need some areas to be white on our image. We need some areas to be black on our image. And it's that difference between the black, the gray, and the white that gives us our contrast on our image. In photoelectric interactions, to kind of sum it up, the tissue atom gets ionized, meaning there's a loss of an electron. Typically, that takes place at the inner shell, and that vacancy makes the atom unstable. In order for it to regain stability, a characteristic cascade takes place. 
producing secondary photons in the patient. And these secondary photons are relatively low energy because you're talking about body atoms, which are typically low atomic number elements and low binding energies of the shell levels involved. So these secondary photons get absorbed in the body and they absolutely contribute to patient dose. Typically, the probability of a photoelectric interaction taking place depends on the energy, energy of the incident photon, the atomic number of the tissue atom in which it's interacting, and typically the incident X-ray photon energy has to be greater than or equal to the inner shell binding energy of the tissue atom involved. Okay, so it depends on the energy of the photon, the atomic number of what it is you're trying to pass through in the body, and the X-ray photon energy. So the probability is directly proportional to the third power of the atomic number of the absorber, meaning, um, what is the, typically what that means is the relationship that if we make a change in our KVP setting or there are small changes in the atomic number of the tissues, like if there's a pathology or something, um, then there's a large change in the probability of a photoelectric absorption interaction taking place, right? If the tissue has a higher atomic number, then there's more probability of photoelectric interaction taking place. All right, so bone tends to show up white because it does photoelectrically absorb the photon. Remember, bone is typically made of calcium, which is atomic number 20. And remember, everywhere there's absorption, there literally is zero exposure to the IR that's why it looks bright white on our image, is because nothing passed through the part in order to make an exposure on your receptor. This is the areas where you get the light or the bright areas. So photoelectric has to take place. Just realize that there is an increase to patient dose. So we try and balance both of those things. All right. Next reaction is called pair production. And in pair production, you actually create a pair of electrons with opposite charges. So this takes place when the incident X-ray photon has enough energy to escape any interaction with the orbital electrons, but it interacts with the nucleus of a tissue atom. When it does that, it produces two particles. It produces a positron and a negatron. So it basically produces two electrons with opposite charges. Now, this only takes place at energies of 1.02 mega electron volts. So this very high energy incident photon here has to have energy of at least 1.02 and it's mega electron volts. So it's capital M, which is 10 to the sixth mega electron volts. This is 1.02 mega electron volts or higher. All right, so that incident photon comes in and has enough energy to escape interacting with any of the orbital electrons, but it interacts directly with the nucleus, and it produces two particles, a positron, which is a positively charged electron, and a negatron, which is a negatively charged electron, which is no different than any other electron, but they want you to realize this is coming from a pair production event. In order for these particles to exist, they have to each have energy of at least 0.51 mega electron volts. Both of these particles travel out of the atom 
And the negatron, realistically, can undergo many interactions before it comes to rest or fill a void in another atom. The positron, on the other hand, travels until it strikes or finds a free electron. And when that positive electron combines with that free electron, meaning they have opposite charges, the two, let me go back to the picture for a second. So this high energy incident X-ray photon of at least 1.02 mega electron volts comes in, avoids all the orbital electrons, but interacts with the nucleus. The nucleus spits out two particles, a negative electron, which is your negatron, and a positively charged electron, which is your positron. Now this one is no different than any other electron, so it most likely goes and either knocks something out, depending on how much energy it has, or it goes to rest somewhere else to fill an empty void at the end of the characteristic cascade. The positron is highly volatile, and when it combines with a free electron, those opposite charges tend to destroy each other, and what it creates is two photons with both with 0.51 MeV, so they each have half the energy of the original incident photon. And the significant thing about when they annihilate, annihilate each other, they travel in opposite directions. Okay, so it strikes an electron, causes annihilation reaction, and the positron and that free electron are destroyed and their energy is converted into two photons that exit each other in opposite direction, each having 0.51 MeV of energy. And this, I'm sure you've heard the term positron before, especially in positron emission tomography, which is what PET stands for, positron emission tomography. So this does not take place in diagnostic radiology, but in fact in nuclear medicine, more specifically PET scanning. So in those tracers that we put inside the patient, when they are decaying and undergoing towards their half-life, these tracers will emit a positron and a negatron. The negatron will be instantly absorbed after it goes through some of its own interactions, but the positron will find a free electron. They will destroy each other in what's called an annihilation reaction, and each of the photons created from that annihilation reaction will have 0.51 mega electron volts of energy. And our last interaction with matter is called photo disintegration. This takes place when a very high energy incident photon comes in and directly strikes the nucleus of the atom and makes it completely unstable. And the nucleus responds by emitting nuclear particles in order to an attempt to regain stability. So this happens at energies of 10 mega electron volts and higher. And again, capital M for mega electron volts means 10 to the sixth. Okay, so um, the atom becomes unstable. The nucleus uh, regains stability by ejecting nuclear particles. It could spit out a proton, a neutron, um, an alpha particle. Okay, but again, this does not occur in radiography because the energy level required exceeds the KVP range that we use in diagnostic radiology. So you're talking about at least 10 mega electron volts, and we said the diagnostic range is 30 to 150 P KVP, 10 to the third. So this does not occur in diagnostic radiology. This actually takes place in radiation therapy, which makes sense because if something is disintegrated, it's typically destroyed, and that's what you're trying to do in radiation therapy is to destroy um, the cancer cells. The last part of this chapter, they talk about differential absorption. This is actually on page 78. 
Differential absorption is the difference between the X-ray photons that get absorbed photoelectrically and those that actually penetrate the body or pass through. Typically, we refer to those as transmitted photons. So the ones that get absorbed photoelectrically and those that penetrate the body. Because different body structures, different body composition is going to allow the X-ray photons to absorb to different extents, meaning bone will tend to absorb the X-ray photons. The lungs, um, they're full of air and, and that kind of tissue, would not tend to absorb the photons, but rather they would allow the photons to transmit. Okay, when we talk about transmission, Typically, transmission are those x-ray photons that pass through the body and reach the IR. Absorption are the photons that are attenuated or that there's a loss in energy or a loss in quantity. So those that, that are um, reduced in number or reduced in energy, like scattered photons, there's a reduction in energy. The photons that are attenuated by the body don't reach the IR. So typically with transmission, this is giving you your dark shades on the image and absorption giving you your white or your light shades on the image. All right, and remember we need those darks and the lights to give us contrast. Absorption depends on the body tissue density, meaning a radiopaque structure Typically, that the definition of radiopaque means that x-rays um, don't pass through the object very easily. Things like bone, um, contrast media, those are all radiopaque um, items. If something is radiolucent, it tends to allow the x-rays to pass through much easier. Things like air, um, the air-filled lungs, the air-filled intestine. Things that aren't as dense and compact, those are radiopaque objects. So it's the difference between the darks and the lights on your image. Okay, So um, when something is dense, like bone, there's an increase in the probability of the photon being absorbed. And if it's a less dense structure, um, something like the lung tissue, it would have a lower probability of undergoing absorption because those items are more radiolucent. So realistically, differential absorption just says that different body compositions absorb the photons differently, which allows them to show visually different on a radiographic image. All right, that is chapter seven. Hopefully that makes sense to you, those five interactions with matter. Um, if you have any questions or anything was coming off as confusing, please make sure you make note of that so I can help to clear that up the next time we meet. And until then, I hope you guys have a great day. Thank you so much.